So thanks everybody for the uh, hookup. And uh, if anybody is uh, interesting, please do come join us. I'm here to talk to you about uh, Charity Engine. Um, I thought by way of uh, context that uh, I'd start by giving you an overview of our platform, what it is, and then uh, talk about a few use cases we've done with uh, clients and partners, and in particular with a focus on um, telling the story of the evolution of our platform, how each of the use cases uh, led us to develop uh, new and, and generally useful functionality. So to the first point, by way of an uh, overview of our service, uh, we describe Charity Engine as a crowdsourced cloud service. Um, we harness a volunteered computing capacity for commercial use, uh, and we share the revenues with charities. Uh, so we donate our revenues to Oxfam Care. We've made donations to uh, Clean Water Fund, to UNICEF, uh, a range of really good causes. And we also donate a percentage of our uh, compute capacity to scientific research. So uh, towards that end, as of a couple of days ago, we'd uh, uh, considerably exceeded a, a billion CPU hours, uh, core hours, to uh, scientific and medical research. <clears throat> uh, the network is currently comprised of about a million CPU cores, 100,000 GPUs. We have about two petabytes of storage, which in the Filecoin context is not a lot, but our storage is quite performant in, uh, in a way that I'll describe later. We uh, provision our resources uh, in standard instance types to make it easier for people to grok what we do to make it look like a, a traditional cloud service. Uh, also makes it easier for people to make budget decisions on whether the economics of using our platform are favorable compared to a current cloud service, which, uh, uh, which they most certainly are. Uh, you can uh, run your software in any Docker container, um, subject to the specs of the instance types uh, that we have available. So that means you can get your Docker Cub, uh, any, any container from Docker Hub. Uh, container could be on uh, IPFS, uh, or it can just be a container that, that uh, a uh, customer has uh, developed for themselves. Uh, we have an app store, which is to say that uh, we have methods to secure proprietary software and to make that available on the network on a pay-per-hour basis. Uh, our first publishing partner is uh, Wolfram Research, uh, so that means that you can use Wolfram Engine and Mathematica on a pay-for-the-hour basis. So you pay for your runtime and then you pay a premium for the software. Uh, using the system is uh, made easier by a number of uh, standard interfaces we provide. We have an API for programmatic interface interaction. So uh, for instance, you're building a service of some sort and you need a batch computing backend, you can use our uh, API. We have a CLI, so you can just run stuff from the command line and use familiar tools <clears throat> like New Parallel, things like that. So it can be like having a million CPUs right there on your desktop. We have a nice, web UI if you're so inclined. Uh, the web UI also um, allows you to track and manage your jobs in various ways, regardless of uh, the interface that you use to submit the job. Uh, we have a smart contract interface that allows you to uh, provision and, and, uh, and use compute resources and storage through a smart contract. We developed that uh, initially in Ethereum, and uh, as was discussed earlier, we're hoping we can bring that to the uh, Filecoin world as well, since the Filecoin virtual machine is Ethereum compatible. Um, that means you can build things like uh, smart oracles and other kinds of computationally intensive uh, ways of basically bridging the gap between uh, blockchain, in this case Filecoin, Filecoin data, and the rest of the world, particularly, as I said, where those um, there might be some compute that you need to insert in the middle. Uh, I mentioned Wolfram Language as being an application that you can use on our platform, but we have a nice uh, integration with them where you can access uh, our, our compute resources directly from within Wolfram Language. So if you're inside the Wolfram Notebook, it's just a line of code to send your, your work out to uh, process on the Charity Engine network. Uh, and uh, we support Boink. So uh, we've donated uh, hundreds of millions of, of core hours to more than 25 Boink projects as part of our commitment to uh, dedicate a portion of our resources to scientific and medical research. Uh, uh, behind all this now is, uh, is a marketplace so that we can integrate uh, 
in addition to the volunteered resources, uh, GPUs and CPUs in, in data center environments, storage, software, uh, and data. Uh, some key features just to give you a sense of what it is that the platform does. Um, it's critically, it, it's more than just raw resources out there. There's a quite rich scheduling function such that you just uh, point to your input files and your application container and provisioning and scheduled scheduling are, are handled uh, automatically. So uh, you focus on your work. You don't have to really think about infrastructure. You just say, here's my stuff. Here's my container and let me know when it's done. The scheduler is, uh, is fault tolerant. If one of the nodes goes offline partway through, the job will get dispatched and, and rerun somewhere else. Uh, there's a number of uh, validation options for you to uh, uh, get confidence in the results for deterministic computations in any event. Uh, uh, critically, and uh, really the reason why we're here, uh, is that the schedule allows you to send computations to the data instead of vice versa to compute on the data in place, which um, I guess is clear to this, this audience is, is really, really uh, essential for distributed data storage. Uh, data, as now a few people have said, has, has gravity. You really, you really don't want to move it. Uh, so towards that end, uh, we've got now a uh, Filecoin integration so that uh, our clients installed on Filecoin nodes can read and write IPFS and Filecoin data and uh, can compute on that data uh, right in place. Uh, we also, uh, the schedule can uh, ensure that computations get sent to appropriate resources. Uh, and there's a number of parameters you can use for targeting, most notably uh, GPU, does it have uh, the right kind of GPU, does it have enough memory, is there enough storage available, these kinds of things. Uh, and finally, uh, the client installed in a data center environment in particular uh, has two modes it can run in. One is a task mode where uh, as a provider you can be uh, polling the marketplace to see if there's jobs that uh, have compensation that's of interest to you and uh, pull them down, run them, and then uh, shut down the client. Uh, and the other is just let the client run in the background and make use of resources uh, when they aren't being used for other purposes. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the goal here is to give different ways to optimize uh, use of, of your hardware and your infrastructure. So when, uh, when there aren't jobs in the marketplace or, or of your own, uh, you can also, particularly if you're running in service mode, uh, backfill. Um, we have a uh, automated multi-coin mining system, so if you don't have jobs running, uh, you, can, uh, you can do uh, currency mining. Uh, or you can donate your compute time to scientific and medical research uh, for which there's uh, abundant need. Uh, as a demo, uh, we did a, a demo at a recent uh, compute over data workshop a few weeks ago. So rather than rerun the demo now, if somebody wants to see computing on Filecoin in action uh, using our CLI, uh, the URL is here. This uh, QR code, if you snap a picture, will uh, send you right to, uh, to that demo. This will be up again at the end of the talk if, uh, if anybody missed it. Uh, so now some use cases. Uh, first is in the, in the realm of mathematics. Uh, these are all things, as I mentioned, that we've, we've done in the past couple years with uh, partners and clients. Uh, so the first mathematics use case, or a, ma a mathematics use case for discussion here is uh, some people who were working on a problem called the sum of three cubes. Um, it was a math challenge posted in 1954 about whether the numbers between 0 and 100 could be represented in this form as, uh, well, the sum of three cubes. Uh, as of 2019, which is 65 years later, all the values under 100 had been solved except for 42 and 33. Um, in the spring of that year, uh, Andrew Booker, a mathematician from Bristol University, solved 33 using a super, supercomputer at his university. And he had some ideas about how to do 42, but uh, it was going to require an order of magnitude more compute capacity than 33, and the supercomputer people just said that they couldn't do that. And uh, that's, that's uh, where we entered the picture. Uh, so the challenges for this particular problem were that uh, we, in the end, had to deliver uh, 35 million CPU core hours, um, which we did uh, in about three months. Um, on the infrastructure side, this was the first time that we used our custom scheduler 
at that kind of scale uh, was the first use of the CLI, although in this case, in-house, it was us using the CLI to run the jobs on, on uh, Andrew's behalf. Um, but it was the first example, and, and the, the subsequent examples I'll show, of uh, you know, the eat your own dog fruit approach to platform development. So we built these tools because we had a problem, and these were the things that were needed to, to do this kind of work. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, after a couple months, three months, uh, we cracked the, uh, the problem. You can get a sense from the <laughs> length of the strings of X, Y, and Z here, w the size of the search space, which was considerable. Uh, as it happens, we left, let it running a little while longer. We came up with another solution to, to uh, the number three, uh, which for mathematicians, for reasons that are above my pay grade, was uh, of interest. And, uh, and three other numbers under 1,000, which are listed here. Uh, <clears throat> we got some quite nice press coverage about that. We got an article in Scientific American. Uh, and, and there were, there's only a few here shown, but a number of uh, the articles picked up on the association with uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which many of you might, might know about. And it was amusing because we really did solve uh, this, this question with a a planetary supercomputer, as Douglas Adams had imagined. Uh, second use case is uh, in the area of genomics. Uh, we were working with a uh, consortium of academic researchers who had a large uh, data set of sequence data from uh, 78,000 biological samples. They didn't quite know what was in there. And the challenge was to search computationally these data sets um, for each for 10,400 fungal species to make an index so that this data set would be much more useful in the future. Uh, as a aside, um, searching sequence data is fairly compute intensive, as is roughly shown in, in the illustration. Uh, there are, on the one hand, just strings of letters that represent sequences of amino acids, but the challenge is that um, these searches are, are almost never precise, and so it's various kinds of, of fuzzy matching and alignment and so on. So, so it takes a fair bit of compute to, uh, to search and to compare uh, genomics data. So in this particular case of, of searching this uh, uh, set that we had to work with, we had 40 terabytes of data, which we score, stored with three times redundancy. Uh, we distributed it, though, across uh, 375,000 devices. Um, because we need a very high ratio of compute to storage, uh, basically one CPU for every slightly more than 100 gigabits of data, gigabytes of data. And um, that's, again, because it's compute intensive and we wanted this to be performant and, and scalable. Uh, at one point, just as an aside, uh, when we were pushing the data from, our, uh, from a, a data center in, in Lithuania out to the edge nodes, uh, we found we were a tenth of a 1% of all the internet traffic in the country of Lithuania. And we can't really decide if that's like a lot or a little, but we thought it was really cool and we were excited about it, even if it's a small thing. Um, by way of challenges, this was our first project that was both compute intensive as the Three Cubes project was, but also uh, data intensive, uh, as, as you can see in the left column. Uh, this was also the first project that required us to uh, develop scheduling to be able to send computations to nodes hosting particular data. Um, it required us to manage the data redundancy such that if uh, uh, data disappeared from one host, it would, uh, in an automatic way, get uh, reproduced on a new host to make, make sure we always had three copies, uh, so for reliability and performance. Uh, we also developed a nice uh, Jupyter notebook where when you did a search against this data, you could uh, subsequently work with it in a Jupyter notebook. Uh, and so uh, what the researchers were doing is they'd pull down this index data and then uh, query other third-party data sources to add metadata to what they were pulling out. Uh, and at the end of the day, we found uh, well, almost uh, 8 million fungi in that, in that data set. Um, as, a, as an aside, most of this work was done at a workshop, so it was set up. Uh, so almost all that searching uh, was done in a day. Uh, a related project that's come up more recently, which we're very excited about, that uses much of the infrastructure we built from this, is a biosurveillance service we're building for the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. So uh, we get uh, 
sequence data from environmental samples uh, on a daily basis, and we have to search all the, the new submissions on a daily basis for a list of pathogens of concern as provided by the CDC. Uh, and so there's a nice web portal, there's also a notification service, uh, and uh, the good news was that uh, we had been running this for a while and nothing ever happened, uh, but uh, just uh, a few days ago, we found our, our, our first detection, which on the one hand is of concern, on the other hand validates that maybe there'll be some utility in, in what we're doing here. Uh, so third use case is uh, biosimulation. Um, and in particular, this is in the context of uh, uh, a spin-out of, of Grid Republic called Fine Bio, which is uh, doing drug discovery. Um, although one could reasonably say it's the other way around because uh, I got into this whole world for the purpose of doing drug discovery. And we had to build a platform first so that we could uh, do something useful. <clears throat> so in this particular case, our, our problem is we start with data sets of molecules which uh, produce observed biological effects. And what our goal is, is to discover the, the mechanism of action. Uh, so uh, you might, excuse me, you might, for instance, have a list of compounds that are known to be toxic to a malaria parasite, but you don't know how they work. And so you can't make drugs out of them because you can't optimize them if you don't know how they work. Uh, so we want to be able to discover the mechanism of action with, with basically with no prior knowledge uh, about the compounds, uh, which we call reverse engineering biology. You go from observation to mechanism. Uh, we emphasize the, the need to do this with no prior knowledge because it turns out that there's actually a vanishingly small amount of biological knowledge in the world. Uh, if you look at this chart, you'll see, excuse me, that uh, about 90% of pharmaceutical research is focused on less than 10% of genes. In the bottom left, the similar ratio applies to proteins. In the bottom right, not surprisingly, um, this applies through to the commercial world to patents. 90, it's a little bit different there, but maybe 85% of patents focus on less than 15% of human biology. Uh, and what's been fascinating to me is that though the number of papers over the last decades has exploded, this pattern has mostly not changed. You have more and more people writing more and more papers about the same thing. Uh, so if you wanna make discoveries, a lot of them are gonna be in that uncharacterized spot. Uh, and so what that means is, uh, or our approach to this is, well, biosimulation. You have to be able to work from first principles to find solutions because you can't build off prior knowledge. Uh, so in Fine Bio, we basically do massive simulations of small molecules and all the proteins in a cell or an organism, proteins being the building blocks of cells or organisms. So this requires a, a multi-step pipeline with basically four different scientific applications, each of which have different resource requirements. And uh, we start with large sets of raw data, but uh, each step produces data, which become inputs to the downstream sets. Also, we cache data along the way for rerunning uh, steps of the process with, let's say, new model parameters and things like that. So in terms of the platform requirements, um, when we are working actively, we're running about a million jobs a day, about 160,000 core hours a day. And the goal uh, I sometimes describe as near interactive supercomputing, but on a distributed computing network. And I, I say that because originally when we started the project um, on our computer grid, we thought the big advantage of having a, a computer grid like this was that um, we'd be able to, in a production way, run really large data sets. And while that's true, it turned out that, that the real value to having it uh, was in software development because developing these kinds of software pipelines is very iterative. And the ability for us to take a reasonably diverse data set, and in biology, reasonably diverse means big, and to be able to run overnight um, huge amounts instead of having to wait two weeks meant that we could iterate and improve our software at a, at a rate that greatly exceeded what even a big pharma company would be able to do. Uh, so in terms of challenges, this was the first time that somebody who was not uh, a developer <laughs> of uh, Charity Engine using the CLI, uh, we had to optimize the scheduler to uh, make it more effectively uh, meet uh, daily deadlines. This was the first use of our container service at scale. Uh, as I mentioned, 
uh, first case of uh, multi-application workflows, where we had to take outputs from one set of applications, flow them into inputs, we had to cache data for reuse, and so on. Uh, because the scientific applications um, all had different resource profiles, we had to be able to target particular jobs to particular devices within our network uh, that would support those needs. Uh, and of course, compute to data. We, we never wanted to move data around. We always wanted to uh, run jobs where we had uh, cached the data or where the <clears throat> outputs from previous jobs had ended up. So in a whirlwind summary in terms of output, uh, on the left, without getting into it, is a set of experiments. Uh, it's a large number of molecules and a large number of proteins, and the blue boxes show what interacts with what. The middle box is what you get when you use the existing state-of-the-art of molecular docking software, in this case, Autodoc Vena. Well, it's not quite state-of-the-art, but it's widely used and uh, uh, quite reasonable performer. And you see it doesn't work at all. Um, because it doesn't work in uh, basically when you have a small chemical space and when you have a, a large set of proteins. And uh, on the right, you see uh, the performance we were getting from our, our engine. Now, usually I show this in the context of talking about the uh, science of, of that project. But in this context, what I mean to show is that uh, distributed computing really works um, and that computing on a distributed network uh, can help you address problems that are really intractable in other ways. And, and finally, in this particular case, um, distributed computing was an invaluable asset in developing a software because it, it just amplified the capabilities as compared to what we would have been able to get our hands on and afford in a traditional cloud service. So that's sort of the, the whirlwind tour of Charity Engine um, by way of uh, sort of call to action. Uh, if there's people out there who have projects in need of compute resources, uh, please do get in touch. My email is right here. Um, if you have compute resources because you're a Filecoin service provider or a data center or something like that, um, we'd love to add our particular brand of uh, uh, compute as a way to uh, get more out of the resources that you have. Um, if you want to see a, a demo of the service at work, uh, again, this is the link in the QR code to uh, see what it looks like to uh, install it and to use it. And uh, that, I guess, wraps it up. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer them, or um, I'll, I'll be around for the next uh, day and a half or so. Thanks.